So next up, I would like to introduce Roderick Gilbert, who was, will be representing the United States Army today. So how's that? And he's going to be giving us a talk about integrated pest management of scotch broom. So take it away. Yeah, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry for that delay there. My name is Rod Gilbert, and I apologize I don't have a working webcam at home for you to see me. I'm a wildlife biologist at Joint Base lewis McCord, and I've worked out there for about 22 years, most of which have been working in the prairies. The picture you see on the screen right now is one of our nicest prairies. As you can see, there's not a single scotch broom plant in sight, and you're looking at a, across probably several hundred acres there. Um, and, it, and it's just really gorgeous prairie. But it's in the artillery impact area, which burns every year, and fire kills broom very effectively. For the past several years, my job has been focused almost exclusively on prairie restoration for the federally listed tailless check spot butterfly. So during the summer, we burn the prairies to improve habitat and kill broom. And then after the rains arrive, we switch to restoration in those same burn units all through the winter months after the vegetation re-sprouts. We have about 20,000 acres of prairie on JBLM. And when I first started, most of them were choked with scotch broom because we had no prescribed fire program. Today, it's been virtually eliminated in our prairies with prescribed fire. Adam Martin spoke yesterday about the implications for fire and fuels, and Nate Johnson will talk later today about managing broom with fire. So I'm not gonna say much more about fire. However, if we have time at the end of my presentation, I've included a, three, uh, a short three minute video I took a few, few years ago of one of our prescribed burns, where we kill lots of broom and young invading Douglas fir. Over the years, we've tried many different ways to control scotch broom on JBLM. So I'm here today to talk about the integrated pest management of scotch broom and some of the considerations you need to take into account when first starting a broom control project. I'll then talk a little bit about some of the control methods available to you and then go through some of the best management practices the restoration community has learned over the years. Whoops. So what's the definition of integrated pest management? If you look online, you'll find lots of different definitions, most of which are essentially the same, but with slight twists. I like to use this one, which is integrated pest management is a pest management strategy that uses a combination of best management practices and methods to control or eradicate Scott's broom with the least impact to the environment. And the definition of best management practices are those practices that combine scientific research with practical knowledge to control a pest or weed with the most efficient control method and the least impact to the environment and native vegetation where possible. So if you've not seen an IPM pyramid before, it looks like this. It's pretty straightforward. You will start at the bottom of the pyramid and then work your way up as you try different methods to control a new weed. Essentially, as you move up the pyramid, it's going to increase the environmental impact. So obviously, if you can control your weeds or pests, starting with methods that have little impact on the environment, use those first. It's common sense, really. But we've had broom around for a long time now, and we usually have areas that have a lot of it. So we usually go straight to the physical or mechanical, biological or chemical means of control. And most of the time, it's either chemical or physical mechanical. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have a prevention and education, which includes things like outreach to environmental groups, schools, colleges, general public, prohibited sales in nurseries. And there's also lots of good information on websites like the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board and County Noxious Weed websites with details on how to control various weeds. King County also has an excellent website with lots of great information on it. For cultural control, there are really only a few options available. Shading out the patches of broom is one way to eradicate it, but can take years to establish. Scotch broom likes to grow in full sun, and if you can block the sunlight by planting other plants like Douglas fir, it doesn't do nearly as well. And if you can block out the sunlight completely, it'll eventually kill the plants. But this takes time, and is more for a long-term control. Another cultural control is preventing seed migration by cleaning vehicle tires, boots, socks, etc., Hitching a ride on vehicles is one of the main ways seeds move around. 
I think Kathy Lucero will be talking later today about keeping seeds out of soils and rock for projects where it needs to be brought in. This was a huge issue in Mount Rainier National Park several years ago, where weed contaminated sand was spread along roads during icy conditions because no one thought to kill them in the sand when they had it stockpiled. The main cultural option available to you is prescribed fire, but I suspect most of you can't use prescribed fire. But if you can, it's by far the, the best way to go. JBLM is a federal agency, so many of the rules like burn bans don't affect us because we have our own fire department on base. So we burn through the summer months as long as the air quality allows us to. But prescribed fire after the burn ban lifts, which is uh, usually in early October, can still have a significant impact on broom. If you can't burn, then your next option will be physical and mechanical. The best method will be hand pulling plants that are small or pulling with a weed wrench if the plants are bigger and you don't have too many plants. These two methods have virtually no impact on the environment and can be a great education for groups. Other methods include mowing, usually with a tractor with a pull behind mower deck or a skid mower like a, bob mower, like a bobcat that has the mowing, mowing deck in the front. They each have their pros and cons and I'll talk about that later. Another option is a weed whacker with a metal blade that can easily cut through broom, as you could see uh, in Ray's uh, picture there. These are highly effective in areas where there's widely scattered broom, especially. Scotch broom is also allelopathic, which means it leaches toxins into the soil to prevent other plants from germinating. We've noticed at JBLM that often nothing will germinate under broom that's been there for a long time, except other English weeds that have adapted to growing with it back in Europe. Therefore, if you have the option to remove broom from the site, do. Otherwise, I would recommend that you stack it and burn it in winter months, as it's possible that cut stems may also release toxins as it decays. Another option is a masticator. Now, these pieces of equipment are usually expensive, but a good option if you're in an area where you have really impenetrable or tall growing or tall broom growing with other shrubs and that you're not able to either spray or mow. The next slide, when we get to it, will show the masticator that our forestry program uses. Next level in the pyramid is biological control. Paul Pratt spoke yesterday about Scotch broom gall mite, and Jennifer Andreas will be talking later about the efficacy of biological control agents in Washington. So I won't say any more other than there are a few options out there available to you. You may be wondering why biological control is above physical and mechanical control as far as impacts to the environment. And the reason is, if biological agent they use migrates to different species, especially native ones, it could have a very serious impact. In the early days of biological control, there often wasn't a lot of research done before introducing a biological agent. But these days, there's a considerable amount of research and testing done before they release them. But one possible example where it may have had a negative impact in our native prairies is when they released the cinnabar moth whose larvae can completely defoliate tansy ragwort plants. The tansy ragwort used to be an extensive problem weed in South Puget Sound about 60 years ago, and there was a considerable effort to eradicate it. Part of that effort was releasing the cinnabar moth. However, we have a prairie plant now that is virtually extirpated from our prairies called Puget butterweed, which is in the same family as tansy ragwort, and until recently in the same genus and we found cinnabar larvae feeding on them. I suspect that this native plant was much more common historically in the prairie than it is today, and that cinnabar larvae must have negatively impacted. At the top of the pyramid, we have chemical control, and for us, that means systemic and pre-emergent herbicides. You can either boom spray or spot spray or even cut and dab, which is where you cut a broom plant a few inches off the ground and wipe on a high concentrate of brush herbicide over the cut stems. You usually use around a 50-50 solution as you use very little, and this is a very effective way of controlling small amounts of broom with very little herbicide, but it is time consuming. It also works on other shrubs and trees. You only need to dab the cambium and inner bark layers on them. If you want a boom spray and don't have a tractor, I'd recommend getting a UTV with a 12 foot boom. You can mount an 80 gallon tank on back and it's far cheaper and easier to move around and maneuver on site than a tractor. 
In the early days on JBLM, before we burned, we tried a couple of pieces of equipment to herbicide large patches of broom. Both were pulled by a tractor with a PTO attachment. One was a machine that was meant to cut the broom and release a small amount of herbicide along the blade and into the stem as it cut it, kind of like the cut and dab method, but on a larger scale. We also tried a wipe-on herbicide contraption that essentially had a series of pads about two feet off the ground that wiped on herbicide as you drove over the broom and made contact with it. Neither method was particularly effective at killing broom and both leaked quite a lot of herbicide that had collateral damage to surrounding plants. Pre-emergent herbicides prevent everything from germinating, not just scotch broom, and can be very useful in areas where you had a significant amount of broom sitting for a long time with a large seed bank. So here's the picture of the forestry masticator mounted on a skid steer. Um, they make a whole series of different attachments depending on what you need for your job. It was really the only option on this project for the size and density of the broom seen here in the photo. It looks like the broom is about 12 to 14 foot high, growing in an old logging landing. Mowing or spraying wouldn't have been very effective in this instance. But as you can see, masticators are very destructive. This also won't kill the plants, but it does allow forestry to come back and spray them in a year or two. So here's a picture of our bobcat with a front mower deck attached and our tractor pulling a rear mowing deck. The advantages of a skid steer mower are that you can see what you're about to mow better and you can use it on steeper slopes than a tractor. The skid steer mower also mulches up the broom better without pushing it over first, so you get a better, more effective cut. However, a disadvantage of the skid steer mower is that you can't see what you're mowing as well as a tractor if the broom is tall. It's also very easy to cause soil disturbance with zero radius turning in the skid steer. The tractor is smoother for ride operators, and some people even get motion sickness in a, in a skid steer. Now, all mowing, no matter what type you use, can have a fairly significant impact on the environment, especially if you mow in the spring or early summer when there's wildlife present or nesting birds using the broomer on the ground. So if you can complete your mowing in winter months, that would be best. So there are some questions you'll need to consider before you start your broom control project. And knowing the answers to some of these will help you determine what are the best IPM methods to use on your site. The first thing you should always do is survey your site carefully. First, estimate roughly how many plants you have on site and what the age the majority of them are and how they're growing. Are they large or small or a mix in size? Are they tightly packed together or are they widely dispersed? How many seedlings are there? Next, what's the location of your project? You need to take into consideration any action you take near residences, wetlands, natural areas, or if it's a place where people visit frequently, especially if you're gonna be using herbicides. Next, how accessible is your site and the plants for various IPM treatments? Are you able to treat all the plants with one IPM method, or will more than one method be required or be more effective? For example, if you have a lot of broom interspersed with Douglas fir, then you're likely not going to be able to effectively boom spray. Can you get equipment on site easily? Tractors with a rear mower deck require a large trailer and truck to pull it. Will there be room to turn around? Are you working next to a road? I'm sure Ray will be mentioning this in his talk tomorrow, but as herbicide, often, herbicide use often upsets people when they see it carried out, it may be advisable to use mechanical methods when near busy roads. So boom spraying probably won't be an option, but spot spraying might be. In most cases, you'll probably have to resort to mechanical methods. So what resources do you have available for your project? Obviously the most important one is budget. The more money you have, the more options available to you. What equipment do you have available? Do you need to rent or borrow some, or do you need to buy some new equipment to perform your IPM treatments? What human resources do you have available? For example, if you have a huge, a huge pool of volunteers, you could pull all your broom for you. What herbicides and PPE do you have available? Another really important question is, what's the goal of the project? 
Do you want a complete eradication? If you do, you'll need to either burn or spray it and repeat. If you just want to control seed, produ seed production because maybe you don't have a budget to do more, or if you just want to keep line of sight open, or if your site, or your site accessible, then your option is to mow it yearly and perhaps use a pre-emergent herbicide. But repeated mowing is unlikely to kill the plants, and they often flower soon after resprouting when they're just a few inches tall. If you just want to tempor temporarily control it over a few years, you can mow it every few years as the plants start to bloom and prevent it from seeding. So next, what's the vegetation type on your, on your site? Does it contain a lot of native plants? If so, you're gonna to have to be really careful with the use of herbicides and the timing of them. If your site is a weedy waste area, then you don't need to be as concerned with collateral damage to native plants and you can spray any time of year. But again, be aware of wild, wildlife using the area. Personally, I never boom spray after February so as to avoid wildlife and native plants that are just emerging. Do you have open forest land which could complicate your treatment? Or are you near a riparian area or wetland edge? If you are, you're going to need to read your herbicide label to see if it's aquatic approved in case of runoff, and perhaps you'll need an aquatic permit. And finally, how big is your infested area? There's no set definition as to what defines a large or small area for broom control. It will mostly depend on the resources available to you, but I'd consider more than 20 acres to be large for controlling broom. Medium would be between two and 20 acres, and I would consider less than two acres to be small, but I've known people who have pulled plants with a wrench by themselves on sites up to five acres successfully. So it's a lot of work and takes a lot of time. So your options for large, medium, and small areas really depend on the number of plants you have and how they're arranged. In large areas with lots of plants, your only options are really burning, biological control, mowing or mastication, or boom spraying. Adding a pre-emergent to the mix will prevent any new germinants for about a year. If you can't complete your project with one year and you have a lot of widely scattered plants mixed in with areas of dense infestation, always start with the outliers first. It's, be it's better to control seed set in scattered plants than in dense infestations where there's already a significant amount of seed bank. If you have a medium-sized site, your options will be a mixture of the large and small site options. In small areas with a few plants, a weed wrench or, a hand, or hand pulling is probably the easiest and least impacting way to go. You can also use a backpack sprayer or you can cut and dab. You can also mow them, but if you only have a few plants, it would be more effective to pull them. So I'm gonna run through some of the best management practices. The first two are specific to all herbicide applications. First, always read the entire label and use the correct PPE. And remember, the label is the law. The next one's fairly obvious, never spray in windy conditions or inversions, as the collateral damage can be quite considerable because the herbicide can drift off site. Um, I would recommend only using systemic broadleaf shrub herbicides if you're going to use them. There are several that are very effective on the market. Garlon XRT, Crossbow, and Garlon 4 are some that work well. Glyphosate can work on smaller or newly germinated plants, but not so well on small plants that have been cut and have regrown as they already have an extensive root system. You can often kill larger plants in late fall with glyphosate, but there's nothing worse than having to come back and respray plants. So I always use what I know will kill it for sure the first time. However, broadleaf herbicides are more expensive than glyphosate, so if your budget is limited, it will likely be, be your herbicide of choice. A mix of glyphosate and milestone apparently works well, and you can get some residual effect from milestone for about a year after application on new germinants. Always spray the whole plant. Leaving one branch unsprayed often fails to kill it. Consider applying herbicide during the winter months, especially if you're in native habitat to avoid collateral damage and test whatever herbicide you're gonna use first on the plants to make sure it works during the winter months. You'll have to wait a few months to know for sure. Again, there's nothing worse than spraying a whole bunch of plants only to find out it's been ineffective. So 
So if you can't mow during winter months, um, I think I've got the wrong slide. There we go, sorry about that. Um, if you can't mow during winter months, carry out any mechanical treatments as the plant blooms, but before seed set, but you won't kill the plants. However, you can get some kill from mowing after it's flowered and the seed has dropped when the plant's resources are more depleted and potentially stressed from a dry summer, but you won't prevent it from setting seed. So you'll have to weigh the pros and cons of both. It's important to try to never let seed drops because they can stay viable for several years. If you're spraying larger plants, think about mowing during the winter and spraying after they re-sprout in a year or two. You need quite a lot of regrowth to get enough herbicide on the plant to kill it. Spraying newly sprouted plants soon after mowing will likely only top kill them. Spraying re-sprouted re plants also uses less herbicide, there's less collateral damage, and they're easier to spray than large plants. Plant grass in bare areas to prevent broom germination especially if you're using glyphosate. Extensively grassy areas really help restrict germination. If you spray during the winter months, consider using a liquid solution of ammonium sulfate, uh, which is just really a 20 nitrogen fertilizer. It increases the efficacy with glyphosate and other emulsifiable herbicides, and you can get a 100% kill rate on herbaceous forbs and grasses in temperatures as low as 36 degrees Fahrenheit. But I haven't tried it on broom, so I would suspect you have a higher kill rate using it than not using it. Scotch broom is allelopathic, so if you can remove any cut, um, cut plants from site, that's best. If not, stack them and burn them when the burn ban is lifted. Check to see if you need a, permit, a burn permit first. It depends on your location. Hand pull smaller plants when the soil is moist as they come out of the ground more easily. And that's also true if you're using a weed wrench or larger on larger plants. Pulling larger plants usually causes soil disturbance. So scrape the soil back into the holes that are made. So I think that, um, that brings me to the end of my talk today. So thank you for this. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar. I'll be around for the question and answer session after today's presentation. So here's the video of the prescribed burn from a few years ago. It was first entry burn, and the first entry burns are always more exciting because the fuel loads are so much greater. You'll notice that we'd already burnt the opposite side of the road earlier in the year. As you can see, I've just stepped out of the unit rather than inside the unit. So what's happening now, you have two black liners coming from opposite directions who are going to just tie up and close the, uh, the, the, the unit. I just want to confirm that you're all clear. We're, we're starting to get close to holding southwest. You can really see it starting to take off up in uh, this area here. Those are blanks going off. Seven oh one, holding west. Yeah, watch uh, the base of those trees for UXO. I'm not sure the last time this burned, so there's probably quite a bit of rounds under there. Yeah,
Holding west, Fairfax. Holding west. Yeah, a little warm in there. I think it'll clear out off on East Cage in a little bit. Copy, yeah, we got complete, so it's built pretty straight up right now. Uh, those duck fur are getting toasted. Our goal in these burns is obviously to kill dog fur as well as broom. Yeah. Yeah, I think we may not want to put people in there to mop up as little as possible. Maybe sweat down those five bigger pines real quick, but not spend much time. Yeah. Yeah, this area's been treated and broomed for as long as I can remember, so who knows what people dumped in there. Rod, you've got two minutes. Okay, uh, it's just about the way. And actually, I have one more that's one minute long. So I think we'll be good. That was quite a column, that one for that. So uh, this literally is less than a minute. Maybe we can just get this one going. Yeah, go for it. It's just more killing, bro. So it makes me happy to watch it. Die, Broom, die. So often when you burn these prairies, the broom will look very green after the fire's gone through. But you come back the next day and it's just brown. Okay, that's the end of it today. Thanks, folks, for listening. Uh, I'll be around later, like I said.